This uh, week I had uh, at least two conversations uh, with individuals. Um, and it, it went something like this. It went, um, wow, new year, uh, you know, 2018 is coming to an end. Uh, 19 is right around the corner. Any regrets? Well, that's a loaded question, right? And I remember driving with an individual and uh, we're in this very fancy car. Very, very fancy car. And, and the gentleman said, no, 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 we're, you know, I, I have no regrets. I said, really? No regrets? Really? At all? Wow. I, I have tons. <laughs> I have tons of regrets. <laughs> but when you think of regrets, you think like, you know, the movies sometimes tell us that we should have no regrets. You know, I can imagine the movie scene with, you know, the rugged leading role saying, I have no regrets after a long life lived. And yet, I wonder how realistic that is because I have tons of regrets. Uh, regrets from growing up, regrets from uh, yesterday, regrets from even this morning. Uh, just life is like that. Life is like that. And I think it's very important as we look into 2019 that we, we take a little checkpoint and we start thinking about that. See, with, with regrets, it's one of those things, regrets can gnaw at you. They can keep you up at night. You can have sleepless nights with all sorts of regrets. I remember there's, there, there was this one night when just I just couldn't go to sleep and this, this stupid thing that I did, I was like just coming back and coming back and coming back and I'm like, oh, really? Come on, I need to get to sleep. No, it, you just. Uh, 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 uh. Well, and, and regrets, by the way, are very different than lessons learned, right? You, you, sometimes if you're in a work situation, you do something, and then after the entire project, okay, let's get together. You know, what have we learned from this? What's the, right? Or, or with, with your young ones, sometimes, you know, they, they do something, they break a vase, the, who knows what, and you bring them to it. Okay, now, what did you learn from this little Johnny? See, regrets is very different than lessons learned. Lessons learned are, are good because we're, we're going over it. But regrets, man, regrets can paralyze. Regrets can be one of those things that you're faced with and all you're like deer in the headlights. And you feel like, I can't do a thing. I'm numb. I can't, I can't engage. I can't even get up. I can't even get dressed in the morning because I have so many regrets. So, Regrets can paralyze, but you know what? Regrets can also motivate. Regrets can, can get you going. It's like, you know what? I'll never do that again. And then you start thinking about the, the, that one thing that you, yeah, no, never again. I'll, I'm not going after that again. So, and, and so regrets can either paralyze or motivate. So I think it's very important right now at this New Year's, as people make New Year's resolutions. Do you guys do that? I know there's, the, the world is split. Some people are like, oh, don't make any New Year's resolutions because you can't keep them anyway. And there are others that say, no, 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 you should, you should have at least something. I don't know if you guys heard the commercial uh, on, on the radio. You know, the gentleman comes on and says, oh, you know, maybe I'll spend some time with some people. And maybe I got to stop doing some things and start doing some others. And they're like, wait, that's sort of generic. Well, I don't can't do anything. I'm perfect. And, and, and you think, really? Wow, are we, are we that self-focused in our society? But, you know, New Year's resolutions, we're making them. Some people are making them. I, I, I don't mind them. I, I, I like to start thinking, okay, what, what do I want different in 2019? What do I want to be like? What do I want to do? How do I want to think differently? And... Uh, it, because of this kind of transition between 2018 2019, I think it's important for all of us, myself included, by the way, um, it's all important for all of us to handle regrets properly. See, because regrets not handled properly have a way of coming at you. And it's that, it's almost like that, that uh, a metal door that you decide not to scrape the rust off and you decide just to paint over the rust. It's coming back. The rust will come back. And I think regrets are a little bit like that. Or it's like the mold in the, in, in, in the basement. They say, well, you know, let me just paint over it. 
It might look fine for a while, but the mold will come back out. So I think it's important to handle regrets in the, in the right way, in the proper way. Especially now that we are in January starting our 21 days of prayer. Uh, we're starting that in January. It is a, it's a good way to recalibrate, to start thinking about how do we start. And, you know, it's starting. It, it just feels right to start with prayer. Uh, it's something that I think will help us in 2019. And in, in the slide, you can actually see that there's the verse, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. And that's found in James chapter 5 in verse 16. And by the way, earlier on when I, when I welcomed you, I read from the first part of James, uh, the, James chapter 1. Well, this is found in James chapter 5 towards the end of the letter that he wrote. This is part of a letter that, that he wrote. So I thought it would be very important not only to look at this verse, but to look at the entire James chapter 5 to sort of understand the context of this verse and see if it can help us with, um, with our regrets question. So uh, let's turn uh, with me, please, to James chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with you, there's some Bibles in the pews. I believe those in the pews are the NIV version, uh, New International Version. I'll be reading the same. Um, and while you're looking at James chapter 5 or looking to find it, by the way, if you have electronic Bible like mine, I'll pull it up. It's really easy. Search on it. Grab your phones out and, uh, and, and grab your Bibles out. By the way, if you are joining us via video, a welcome to you. Um, it's fantastic that you have chosen to, to spend this time with us. Uh, spend uh, and, and participate in the life of the church, not just virtually via a listening to a message, uh, but participate in our social media and interact with us, interact with the body uh, that way. All right, James chapter 5. And let me read these verses to you. I'm actually going to read the entire chapter. You'll see it's in three parts. James chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay, the workers who mowed your fields, are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves on the day of slaughter. By the way, the day of slaughter is also the day of party. That's when they slaughter the animals. So the day of slaughter is a phrase that says it's the party day. So you have fattened yourselves on the, on the party day. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who, has not, who was not opposing you. Verse 7. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too. Be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance, have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my sisters and brothers, do not swear, do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing, sing, uh, sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, 
If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Friends, let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for these words. I thank you for James writing them down. And I thank you that they have been preserved uh, to us today. Lord, as I um, cover the things that I have learned from you, as I share some of the insights that I too have learned, would you, Holy Spirit, make my words clear? Would you please prepare our hearts to listen and be transformed by you? And may this time be a time of glorious worship that honors you and transforms us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so when we look at James 5, there's really three parts to it. And if, you, uh, if your Bible has these three sections, you sort of know what they are. The first one starts with a warning and perhaps an accusation. And, you know, is it, is it useful to start with a warning or an accusation here, you know, as we finish 18 and start 19? Perhaps, perhaps. Uh, because, see, consider regrets. Consider the regrets. Uh, as you think about the regrets that come to mind, my question to you is this. Are you noticing any patterns? Are you noticing any common threads about regrets? Well, that might be an interesting exercise to go through personally because I actually went through that and I started writing down some of these regrets and, you know, I, I, I took a little scratch piece of paper and I just started writing things down. And you know what I noticed? I noticed that there's a pattern. I noticed that my regrets uh, tend to, to, to multiply or there were more regrets when I was in a selfish state of mind. When I was self-focused and I started thinking only of myself, I started doing things that I regretted. And when I started thinking about others and being others-focused, love-oriented, love-focused, I had less regrets. And perhaps that's that first section of our James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, if you notice, especially verses 5 and 6, it really talks about selfishness. It really talks about uh, having a self-indulgence. Now, I know it's sort of mean to talk about self-indulgence and overeating right after Christmas. I know that, and I apologize. Because you know what? I probably did it too. No, okay, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. And I probably did it. I did it too. But, but when you think about food or when we think about self-indulgence, we, rare, we think of the people that, you know, uh, spend all those things on themselves and are mean to other people. But, but we don't think of self-indulgence as going somewhere and saying, well, let me just party and not think of anything else. See, I, I wonder if, if there's a little bit something there to be had. I wonder if there's something for us to take away with us uh, today, this morning, and say, you know what? That self-indulgence, when I, when I start thinking self, maybe that's not the best. Maybe not the best. Now, in all fairness, in our society, self-indulgence, we, we, we have a way of talking about it or, or covering it up in such a way that it doesn't sound so bad. We talk about comfort. We talk about providing for the family. We talk about things like me time. Have you had me time? I, I had a conversation with somebody who said, well, pastor, I can't, I can't come to church because I need my me time. I'm like, oh, all right, great. Have your me time. It's acceptable in our society to have me time. 
at the expense of others' time. It's also, we talk, we talk about, uh, you deserve it. You deserve it. I mean, how many times do we, all right, imagine this. You go out shopping. It's Christmas. You, you go out and start shopping for other people, and all of a sudden you say, ooh, I could use that. Did it. Been there, done that. All right, so, so I go out shopping for, for my wife, for example, and I end you know, buying her like one or two things, and I buy myself five things. Like, wait a minute, that, that just, <laughs> just doesn't seem right. It's a little bit of self-focused, isn't it? Self-indulgent. So friends, in our society, the, the current, the push, the, the, the trend, the, the river that takes us along this me time, this comfort, it, it, it's taking us down the path. And I think the Lord is saying, no, 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 swim against it. Swim against the me time. Swim against that self-indulgence. Don't believe the words that say you deserve it. Because perhaps I might drag you like a river might drag you down. Okay, so that's verse 5. Now what about verse 6? When you look at verse 6, that's an interesting uh, uh, verse. Because it says, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. And you think... When I first read this, I'm like, well, I didn't murder anybody. I mean, I, I haven't. I mean, that's just the truth. Especially innocent people. I have not murdered innocent people. And, and you know, it's just not me. And I started thinking about our society. And I started thinking about what we do as Americans. As world citizens. I started thinking about who are the innocent ones. And I thought about poverty. And I thought about those that live in poverty and perhaps get taken advantage of. I thought, well, you know, they, they could, you know, resist. You know, they, you know, they may not resist very well, but... And I started thinking, well, who else is innocent? Who else are the innocents that we murder? Then I saw something on a social media that said that if you were to take an unborn turtle and destroy those eggs in, in a, a turtle nest, you would be liable. You, you would get a fine, a hefty fine, and perhaps even spend some time in jail. Did you know that? Yeah. You, you go and destroy one of those protected endangered turtles' nests, that's a, that's, a, that's a felony. That's a, and I, I don't know if it's a felony, but I know it's a, big, it's a big deal. You don't do that. But did you know that it's okay to destroy unborn human beings? And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. It hit me like a ton of bricks because we're okay protecting turtles. And society says, yeah! You deserve to go to jail for killing that turtle nest, disturbing that turtle nest. And that when you think about the human nest, we think it's okay. We think it's okay to spend the money that is required to destroy human beings. Regret? Yeah. And here's, here, when I started thinking about all the, the complexities of that issue, I mean, there's so many complexities and there's so many layers. There's social layers, there's family layers, there's political layers of how do we protect the unborn, the, those, those unborn human beings, not just the turtles. I love the turtles. I think they're fantastic. And we should. And they're when I consider the complexities, I, I ended up with one question, and that is, can I fix a wrong by doing wrong? Can I, can I fix something that was wrongly done? People talk about, you know, you know, what about rape situations? What about all the... Well, that is wrong. That is evil. But can I fix that evil? Can I fix evil by committing, committing evil? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And this regrets meditation that I started thinking about in, in this verse. 
So I think verses 5 and 6 speak to us as a warning, as, as, as us thinking about it. Uh, you know, how do we swim against society? How do we go against the, the river that takes us down and saying, yeah, you can go ahead and be self-indulgent. And you know what? It's okay because it's all about you. Who cares about anyone else? Who cares about the innocence that we should be protecting? But we can't fix a wrong by doing wrong. Well, and then the second part, you know, the first part is a warning. The second part is an encouragement. In verse 7, verse 7 in our text starts with two words that I tell myself all the time. Be patient. (laughs) Do you think you could tell you that to yourself sometimes? Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. See, patience is a wonderful thing, especially when you consider eternity. Eternity is a long time. And whatever is bothering us now is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit in the scheme of eternity. Eternity is a long time. Be patient. Now, there's a difference between generic patience. Yeah, I should have some patience. And there's a difference between that and patience in suffering. And this second passage here, starting with verse 7, talks about being patient in suffering. See, um, when patient runs thin, do you know what happens? All right, so imagine yourself. You're doing fantastic work, and you're doing great things. You're celebrating Christmas. You're, you know, going partying or whatever you're doing. And all of a sudden, you know, something happens, and, and uh, things are not settled anymore, and you know, you were patient when you're comfortable, right? But something, you know, something irked on you, irked on you. And all of a sudden, you're like, you know, the fuse got shorter and shorter. And all of a sudden, you feel that the patient is so thin. And, and it's like, stop. And you're, you become a little porcupine. And others around you become porcupines. And imagine porcupines trying to give each other hugs. And that's what happens. And all of a sudden, patience is running thin. Well, in the midst of patience running thin, we have verse 9. <laughs> I love verse 9. Here's what it says. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is sending you. Don't grumble against one another. I love that word, grumble. It's fun to say, too. Grumble. Do you know what grumble means? <laughs> <laughs> that's grumbling you know you're rolling up the eyes oh my goodness All right. if I could just tell you what. All right. the, the, the old joke is the old married couple grumbling against each other I mean read Peanuts or whatever other cartoon you know, you know it's grumbling but you know what grumbling makes me think about what grumbling makes me think about is communication gone awry Communication that is not helpful, bad communication, improper communication. Grumbling, by the way, the word, when you actually go into the original language, has the connotation of holding a grudge. Holding a grudge. Well, if you only knew what that brother or sister of mine did. Yeah, okay. It's that holding of the grudge. It's, it's holding it here. Because one day you're going to go like that to the other person. And you're going to grumble against them. It says, verse 9, don't grumble. Grumble. Backstabbing. There's a little bit of an element of that. By the way, sarcasm. We love our sarcasm in our society, don't we? We love our sarcasm. But I wonder how helpful sarcasm is in proper communications. I've done it. I can, oh, I can, ooh, man, it feels good when you say it, don't it? Oh, <laughs> and then you go, oh, man, really, why did I do that? And unfortunately, we do that, I do that with the closest to us, closest coworkers, closest family, closest friends. Verse 9 says, don't grumble. Why? The encouragement is to be patient. Be patient. Well, how do you do that? Well, so you have the warning up there. Okay? Then you have an encouragement. And now we get into the third part, which is some practical suggestions. 
Very practical. Very practical. So look at verses, um, let's see, what is this here? 13 and 14. Let me go there myself. Very practical. Verse 13. Is any among you in trouble? Any of you dealing with some trouble right now? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Happy? Yeah? Good day? Yeah? Well, let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? I know some of you are sick. You're sick? What do you, what do you got? I know there are several people that have called and said, Oh, pastor, I'm sick. I can't come today. You're sick? Look at that. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. By the way, folks, here we have three very practical ministry. Trouble? Well, that's ministry of rescue. There's so many people around us in trouble. we got to have a ministry of rescue, a ministry of engaging those people that are in trouble and helping them. Happy? Yeah, we got happy people around us. Why not? We're, we're happy sometimes. So we got to have a ministry of celebration. Why not? By the way, the Dialogue Cafes that are happening right now, the, by the way, if you're not in a group of Dialogue Cafe, those are the groups of individuals here from the church they get together just to have a meal and just to hang out. Very simple. Very low commitment level. So the Dialogue Cafe groups, that's a ministry of celebration. Why? We talk to each other. We have a meal. We laugh. And are you in trouble? No problem. There's, there's a ministry of rescue. Hey, how can I help? You need help to, to go in the attic? No problem. And the last one, sick. There's a ministry of healing. We all have to heal each other. There's a healing that takes place when we engage with each other. And then, of course, we get to our verse that is our, our uh, 21 days of prayer uh, highlight verse. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. By the way, every Wednesday in January, we're going to get together here at 6 o'clock. We're going to share a meal together. And then we're going to go by the prayer wall. We're going to pray. We're, we'll open up the sanctuary. And we'll come. Come and let's pray together. Maybe we'll, we'll you know, have two or three people praying together. Or maybe we'll have more people praying together. But every Wednesday at 6 o'clock, we're going to get together right here just to pray. Because the prayer of a righteous person is effective. Okay, so um, right after that, in verse 17... I picked up on this, this example, Elijah, who was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. So I started thinking about this earnestly stuff. How does Elijah pray earnestly? And I had this vision in my head of earnestly, where like every, every like minute you'd be like, oh, Lord, you got it all, you know, and a very earnest, and, and then just, just over and over, and just... And I'm thinking, boy, is that, is that, is that what, what this means? So I geeked out a little bit, and I went into, into my, my Greek uh, and, and started digging into the language itself. And by the way, the, the, it was, the, the text was originally written in Greek. So I'm doing all this word study, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's, I don't think that's what it's intended to say. Because when it says, prayed earnestly, Elijah prayed earnestly. The word prayed and the word earnestly it has the same exact root. Has the same exact root. So it's the same word with different endings. It's almost like there was one translation that I read. There was an American translation that they tried to, uh, to say it. Elijah prayed with prayer. And I'm like, you know what? That, that's actually closer to what it's trying to say. It's the same word, prayed, prayed with prayer, pray, pray. It's the same word, prayed earnestly. So I'm thinking, what, what, how, did, how does that happen? And I started reflecting and meditating on it, and, like, and I wrestled with this almost the entire weekend. Like, how, how do I understand this? And I think it's something like this. I think Elijah prayed. He went through all the motions of prayer, meaning he he uh, he. he probably closed his eyes. I don't know. He probably raised his hands. He entered into a method of prayer. 
But as he did so, his prayer was a prayer to God. And it was a prayer that didn't just uh, end at the ceiling. Somehow that prayer was to God and in, was earnest. Maybe repetition is that earnest. But there is something to be said for a prayer that goes beyond just the motion of prayer. A prayer that is meant to God himself where we bring our petitions, we bring our requests. And those requests are, you know, sometimes human being requests. I mean, I cannot tell you that my requests to God are all perfect. There's, you know, the good old song, country song of thank God for unanswered prayers. I can, I, I can tell you, yes. I'm glad that the Lord didn't answer some of my prayers. So, so there's this, one, on one hand, this, this desire, this wish, these requests made to God. But the earnest part has something to do with seeking. It has something to do with a desire to find God's way. A desire to search. So on one hand, you say, well, Lord, this is my request. I, here it is. But the second part, the earnest part is, is it's almost like an investigator saying, I, I desire to seek the Lord's way. I desire to look for what he's trying to do. And there's, a, there's this, this constant seeking for, Lord, what are you doing? Where are you moving? What is your Holy Spirit doing? Because I want to be there. I want to be carried by that river, not the world's river. I want to swim against the world's river, and I want to find your Gulf Stream, because you are moving in such a way, and as I bring my stuff to you, I am hoping to align myself with where you're going. So the earnest part is something that you're looking for. You're, it's something that, that moves on its own without your uh, engagement. It's like a wave that a surfer catches and surfs that wave. That earnest part is that surfing. It's that engaging into the Lord's work. Prayer aligns our person with a divine person. So friends, that's really when I think about regrets. When I think about the, the, the stuff that I'm, I'm thinking, oh, that could paralyze me or could motivate me. I want to take all those regrets. I want to bring them and I want to say, Lord, given the regrets that I have, I want to bring everything in prayer to you. And as I bring my prayer to you, my desire is that I would align myself with where you're going. I want to align myself with your Gulf Stream so that my regrets get tossed into that stream and are being taken and are being handled and you somehow will make everything work together for us and for your glory. So friends, in 2019, as if you decide to make resolutions or not, my prayer is that we would align ourselves in prayer. Uh, these 21 days of prayer, we would not only bring our petition and our prayer requests, but somehow we take these prayer requests, we toss them up into the heavenly stream and say, recalibrate us. Align us with where you're moving, where you're going, so that we may follow you. Our paths aren't clear in 2019. I don't know what it will bring. I don't know what it will bring to you. I don't know if it's going to bring trouble. I don't know if it's going to be, it's going to bring happiness. And I don't know if it's going to bring sickness. But I do know that the Lord's moving. And I do know that if we align with him, the storm could be around us but he will be our rock. He will be the one that will carry us through. Even if it's the valley of death, 
he will carry us through somehow some way i don't know how it's beyond my pay grade but i do know that he's able to i do know that so that is my prayer for you in 2019 i think it's very appropriate for us right now to actually pray together so let's stand and I'm going to give us just a few seconds of silence in which I'm going to ask you guys to bring your regrets and your petitions before the Lord in your mind and your heart in silence. And after a few moments of doing that, I will close in prayer. Then after that, we will read the benediction together. Let's pray. Lord, Father, in spite of our human frailty, somehow you make things happen and you bring things around us that point our way to you. Thank you for that Gulf Stream, that heavenly Gulf Stream that moves and engages. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you work in this world in a magnificent way. We desire that all our loved ones, all the people that we know, this entire community, they would be drawn to you, they would be somehow be brought to you, that we would seek you, you would seek your movement and bring our requests to you and surrender ourselves to where you take us. And Father, you know our regrets. You can see the hearts and the minds of every person here. You can see the hearts and the minds of every person listening to the words via video. And yet, Lord, you love us. You, you can take those regrets and you can transform them into jewels in our crown. You can transform and redeem in a miraculous way. And Father, that's what we are asking you to do. That somehow you'll take our frailty... And in the miracle that you are, that you make things as they ought to be. And we look forward to that. We look forward to the day when all things will as they ought to be, ourselves included, our loved ones included, our neighbors, our co-workers, this whole world, this whole created universe will be as, ought, as it ought to be. And we thank you for that redemption. We thank you for the wonderful things that you have planned for us. And we trust you, Lord. We trust you uh, with 2019 that's coming up. And we put all our plans and thoughts and desires in your hand. Give us the heart to seek you and to obey you. And we pray this in Christ's name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's read together the benediction on the screen. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with all of us forever. Amen.